Good afternoon when I'm recording this and uh, I am actually today in um, in Decatur, Illinois uh, in a revival meeting at the Decatur Pilgrim Holiness Church and um, the Lord's been helping us and so I am recording this coming week's um, lesson and uh, I have a brand new um, I have a brand new um, grandbaby and so I'm going to be seeing it Monday morning and uh, so I'm going to go ahead and try to get this finalized the life of David we're going to look into two sections of this we're going to go back into first Samuel and pick up with the life of David uh, as it progresses uh, through 1 Samuel. And then uh, next week, I will give the overview of the book of 2 Samuel. And um, from there, we will um, look and see what, um, what happens as far as David's life in, in 2 Samuel as it relates to uh, him being king. So with that said, let's let's get started. Before we get started, I'm gonna see if I can possibly um, deaden some of this brightness. I, I, it looks like I'm hazy, and so let me give that a try just a second here. All right, I'm back, it's not going to work, and so I'm gonna go ahead and just continue. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, before we begin this time together. Father, we are so thankful that uh, you are with us. And uh, Lord, just surround us and help us as we begin the study of David's life, that Father, you will help us as we learn from David's life and the things that transpired. And uh, Father, may we uh, not make the same mistakes as King David made, but but Father, help us, Lord, that uh, we will learn from his life. And, and Father, just uh, be able to utilize what we've learned today. We'll give you the praise. Amen. So let's, let's get started. And before we jump into the life of David um, in, in Samuel, for Samuel, let's let's look at some uh, strengths, some weaknesses um, in the life of of um, David that I think would be uh, beneficial for us. Uh, he is known as the greatest king of Israel. Uh, this is this is important. Um, king Saul was the first, but David was the greatest, and, and really. Uh, there were some other kings that came close, but maybe Hezekiah, um, Jehoshaphat, but um, uh, but really, in all seriousness, David was the only king that that really was considered the greatest king. Now, with that being said. Uh, when Jesus comes, he's going to be the greatest king. But again, he's, he's uh, in the lineage of, of David. And so uh, that is exciting. He is, as I've already mentioned, the ancestor of Jesus Christ. And um, again, that gives Jesus the right to be the king of Israel. And uh, both Mary and Joseph uh, lineage was back into David's life. And so that's a uh, that's an interesting uh, point as well. He's also listed in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. David, in all of his um, blunderings, if we want to say it that way, and, and sometimes uh, you sort of want to, oh, why did you do that, David, type moments. He, he was a man of great faith. In fact, um, he was a man described by God himself as a man after his own heart. Uh, sometimes I'll be, I'll be absolutely honest with you. I struggle 
uh, with that. It's like, how can David be a man after God's own heart when he committed adultery, when he did these things? But, but David's heart was always, always um, desirous of God. And when confronted, David always um, confessed. And uh, he truly was a man after God's own heart. But in, in David's strengths and in his wonderfulness, David had some weaknesses and mistakes. The first one was he committed adultery with Bathsheba, with Bathsheba. Uh, one of those moments you just think, David, what were you doing? What were you thinking? Type moments, but it happened. And, um, and so, uh, as much as, as we would like to scrub it out, it, it doesn't happen that way. And um, he also arranged the murder of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. Uh, he brought him home to try to cover his sin, David did. And um, Uriah was such a man, God's army is on the battlefield, I can't do this that he wouldn't go in unto his wife and, and cover David's sin. And David sent his own death warrant in a letter to uh, Joab, his, his general, by the hands of Uriah. And Uriah did not have any idea that he was carrying his own death warrant. He directly disobeyed God in taking a census of the people. This was, this was important. God said, don't do it. David went directly uh, against uh, God in, in, in doing so. And then he did not deal decisively with the sins of his children. That, that, that's another thing that is very, very troubling. And, and again, I, with this shorter, um, how do I want to say it, with this shorter survey that we're doing, um, have you noticed a, um, ha have you noticed a, a pattern developing here? Starting with the last, well, not the last judge. You, you start with, with even Gideon, uh, that great judge. And Gideon, uh, the people uh, did not want his sons because his sons did not walk in the way of, of God. And then you come down to, to uh, Eli and his sons definitely did not walk in the way of, of God. And and uh, they, they were killed by God. And then Samuel follows Eli's uh, possession. Pro, pro, yeah, Eli, I'm sorry. Uh, Samuel follows Eli's example. And uh, his sons, the people don't want. And um, Saul's, we, we, we do not have a lot about Saul's other sons. We know Jonathan was a very, very good man. In fact, as we will see just a little bit later, Jonathan, I believe, really understood that, that God was had anointed David, and he was fine with that. And um, But uh, David comes along, a great king, but does not deal with his family problems. And and um, it was really after the sin with Bathsheba that, um, and, and the, the taking of the senses that David's family began to develop issues and just, just heart-wrenching stories from the life of David. So what are some of the lessons? And I'm trying to find this thing here that, that we could uh, not have stuff on, but anyway, what are some of the lessons from the life of David? He he was, there was a willingness to honestly admit our mistakes is the first step in dealing with them. We're not going to deal with it this week, but when Nathan the prophet came to him and told that wonderful little story of, of the man that took the one and only lamb of his neighbor when he had many uh, to give for the, the people that was coming to, to eat. That riled David up. And he said, that man must be dealt with. And Nathan the prophet says, you're the man. 
but but David in in all of it in the senses in Bathsheba he always admitted it's my fault and that's the first step to really dealing with problems forgiveness does not remove the consequences of sin uh, the Bible talks about this even later on where it says a man shall reap what he sows. Uh, that, that's, that's part of nature. Um, it, it, it's just, just a part of that. Uh, you're going to reap what you sow. If I go out and I sow, sow corn, I can't expect to, to reap soybeans or or potatoes or tomatoes. I, I'm going to reap what I planted. And so the same thing, uh, what we sow in life, even though we ask God to forgive us, we're still going to reap those, those, uh, the consequences. I think of a man that I heard many times and some of the older ones that are watching this video um, will remember uh, this man. But uh, some of the younger ones would not because he, he passed away. And now that I said I'm going to remember it, his name has just left me. Uh, he would sing the laughing song. Um, but he had been, this preacher had been an alcoholic. And... Um, just he he would drink stuff because he didn't have the money to buy regular alcohol he would drink stuff that was that had alcohol in it uh, i think he even said he would drink rubbing alcohol and uh, man i wish i could remember his name now i, I it was there and now it's gone but uh, he would come and 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 speak but uh, he died of cirrhosis of the liver caused by drinking. Uh, it, if you smoke before you get become a Christian and you do it a long time, when you become a Christian, God's not going to take that. You you very well may die of lung cancer. Forgiveness does not remove the consequences of sin. We have to remember that. And then God greatly desires our complete trust and our worship and so as we as we move on into the timeline uh into the life of david um before he be, he was anointed king or before i should have put there in that that slide before he became king we're going to look at some of the things in samuel's uh in the in First Samuel, exactly what was happening with David. And so let's look at the first one, and that is Samuel anoints David king. Now, David was a young, young man. In fact, when God told Samuel that he was going to rip the kingdom from Saul, uh, he said, I want you to go to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse, and I, I want you to anoint the next king. And Samuel walks in and, and, um, in fact, in this, uh, God teaches Samuel a vital, in, in vital uh, lesson. Uh, he, he, he comes in and, and he begins to, he calls Jesse and he says, bring your sons in, bring your sons in. And so the very first one, Eliab, comes in and, and he was a very kingly looking young man. Um. I don't know. It's it's what you find, uh, maybe manly. Uh, maybe he had a square jaw. He he had that rough but refined look, and he um, he was he was a uh, just a Samuel thought for sure he was going to be king. God and Samuel said, "Oh, here's your anointing." God says, "No." Samuel shocked. He calls the next one. He wasn't quite as good as Eliab, but he do. And God says, no. He went through all of the sons of Jesse, and God said, no. And Samuel, he's just, he's, what is going on? 
And finally, he asked Jesse, he says, is this all of your sons? Jesse says, oh, there's one more, but you wouldn't want him to be king. If you notice it here, uh, he, he said, you, you wouldn't want him to be king. And um, it, it, it's quite interesting because in, in verse 12, he, he, was, he said he was ruddy and wherewithal a beautiful countenance and goodly to look at. And uh, some scholars believe that David's look would have looked like someone that was a mama's boy, not, not tough, not rough and tough. He, he probably had rosy cheeks is the ruddy part of it. And uh, he, he just was a mama's boy. And um, sort of the idea was that he wasn't manly enough. I, however, as we will see in the next chapter, uh, David was anything but a mama's boy and anything but uh, he was manly through and through. And uh, we will see that. Uh, as a shepherd, he was he was skillful in, in fighting wild animals. And uh, so um, he comes before, and just to be flat out honest with you, Samuel says, um, he doesn't look like a king, but God says, that's the one to be king. And he anoints David. And um, he, he basically says, um, I'm trying to find it here. Yes, verse 7 of chapter 16, a verse that has been greatly uh, misused. Verse 16, or verse 7 rather, says, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. There's people that's taken this verse to to mean, well, I can do anything I want to do because God looks on the heart. He knows my heart. But, but they miss the whole point here because man sees outwardly. And what I do outwardly ought to tell people of what God has done for us. Saul, or, or Paul, rather, in the New Testament talks about this. And he says, meat to me means nothing, even if it's offered to idols, because idols are nothing. But he said, I will not eat meat if it offends someone. He wasn't using his liberty in a way of, of destroying someone else because Paul knew people did look on the outward. People did watch what I am doing. And what I, what I do affects other people. Think about that. God says we look at someone and say, oh, they are just tremendous, but God really knows the heart of a man. And so he anoints David king. And uh, David, it, it's very interesting. David um, really doesn't, doesn't do a lot. Um, you know, he doesn't walk around puffed up. In fact, in the last part of that, that verse, and we looked a little bit at it, uh, God's spirit departed from King Saul and an evil spirit of God troubled him. 
and uh, they said music would help you, King Saul. Let's let's seek out someone that that is skilled in playing the harp. And, and when the evil spirit troubles you, if they play the harp, that it would would ease the evil spirit. And so they began to seek out someone. And one of the servants of Saul said, I know of a son of Jesse that's very skillful. And I noticed this last week, and I don't want to belabor it, but but um, he um, he says this. Um, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, but the Bethlehemite, uh, verse eighteen. That is cunning in playing, excellent and skillful in playing. And a mighty, valiant man. Let me go back to that skillful in playing. My wife was unable to come with me this week. She was supposed to, but our oldest daughter uh, made my wife and I grandparents for the fifth time. A little baby, a uh, little baby boy, Grant Avery Davis. And we're so excited about it. And uh, I haven't met him yet, seen pictures, and I'm excited about, um, I'm excited about meeting him. But um, in in all of that, uh, my wife had to stay home, so I've been trying to sing by myself, and uh, it's not been going so well. And I I play the guitar a little bit, not well, not well at all. But I played. I thought, well, maybe I can learn and play a couple of songs with my guitar. So I tried it a couple of nights ago. I would sit down and I would play and I was able to make some of the chords. So um, I, I put my strap on and and didn't practice much with my strap on. Went over to sing, put it on, and I'm now holding the guitar and I couldn't make the chords. It was horrible. <laughs> it was pathetic. I was not cunning. I was not skillful. <laughs> but uh, the Lord helped anyway, thank the Lord. But so someone that was cunning uh, in playing, um, and, and, they, and he said, he's also a mighty man of valor and a man of war. Now, it's funny because in the next chapter, King Saul says, you're but a youth. You've not even been trained in war. But we know that David was trained in warfare with fighting animals and uh, prudent in matters and a comely person, a good-looking person. And he says, and besides, the Lord is with him. And so King Saul brings him on and he plays and it soothes his spirit and he makes David a part of his staff. And so... Uh, he becomes a part of Dave, uh, King Saul's staff, and he's on staff, and he plays. However, in chapter 17, the very next chapter, um, Israel goes to war with the Philistines, and King Saul is not going to need David to play the harp, and so he sends David back home, and David goes back to his home to to tend to the sheep, and um, the Philistines and the Israelites are fighting, and, and one dwells on one side, and uh, on a mountain, and, and a valley lay in between, and then on the other hill was the other army, and each morning they would put the armies in array and try to set up a battle, and, and the Philistines had a champion, Goliath, uh, by name. And um, Goliath was a formidable foe. He comes from a long line of giants. And um, he was from the, the sons of Anak that uh, Joshua uh, defeated and Caleb defeated. They remained unto this time. And Goliath was one of the sons of, of this race of giants. Giant was, Goliath was not a beanpole. In fact, it's quite interesting. His armor um, was massive. They say that his coat of mail, and remember, uh, the Philistine god was Dagon. 
a fish god, half man, half fish. The head was, and the upper torso was of a man. The lower body was that of a fish, almost like a, a mermaid type of a deal, but it was a, a, a male god. And um, it, it, so their, their, their uh, armor was like little round fish scales all over. His Goliath's coat of mail weighed 156 pounds, nearly 200 pounds. His helmet of brass had feathers around the metal band, and attached to this band was tiny plates of brass overlay, again, like a fish scale to protect the neck and the sides of the face. He wore uh, sandals, warrior sandals that came up that were brass, brass plated. And um, they were tied in the back, targets of brass between his shoulders. Uh, this piece of armor was highly argued, and some feel that it was a small shield that the warrior could use in battle. Some feel that it was a small round shield-like armor that protected the shoulders. Others feel that it was a javelin or a lance. We, we don't know, but his spear, Goliath, they said his his um, spear handle was like a weaver's beam. And these can vary in size, but they're all very big. And the spear head weighed 16 pounds to 25 pounds. He had a great shield that another warrior carried for him, his armor bearer. And um, it was not necessarily used to, to protect Goliath, but as a status symbol. And so when we see this, Goliath was a, a formidable foe. And so he would come out every day and he would mock God and he'd mock the armies of Israel and challenge them to fight. You send out a champion, let them fight me. And, and if he kills me, we'll serve you. But if I kill him, you could tell it in his voice, this is what he knew would happen, then you would serve us. And when he would come out, when he would come out, King Saul and the Israelites would run and hide. It happened day in and day out. He did this for 40 days. And um, in fact, Adam Clark tells us that in the uh, Targum, uh, one of rabbi's writings uh, it adds much to this speech it says that goliath says i am goliath the philistine of gath who killed the two sons of eli hophni and phineas the priest and led into captivity the ark of the covenant of jehovah and placed it in the temple of dagon my god and it remained in the cities of the philistines seven months also in all of our battles, I have gone at the head of the army, and we conquer and cut down men, lay them as low as the dust of the ground. And to this day, the Philistines have not granted me the honor of being chief of a thousand men. And ye men of Israel, what noble exploit has Saul, the son of Kish, of Gibeah, done that ye should have made him king over you? If he be a hero, hero, let him come down himself and fight with me. But if he be a weak or cowardly man, then choose you out a man that he may come down to me. And this type of talk and this type of champion fighting champion was, was actually very common in that day. And then Goliath began to curse and make fun of the God of Israel. In the notes that is on the lesson for this for this week, uh, I have two sermons that I have preached uh, concerning this story that I have given for you to to look over. Some of it is duplicate, but but um, I, I want to give this. He was convinced. David comes down. His father sends him to go check on his brothers. You see, back then. 
for a warrior to have food, the family supplied it. If family didn't bring you food, you didn't eat. And so David was sent with food to the for his brothers, with food for the, the captains, and to bring back news of the battle. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have the internet to, to keep up to date on the battle. David comes down and he's talking to his brother when Goliath comes out and challenges uh, the army of Israel and curses and defies God. And David becomes convinced there's a cause. And before we can do anything about a cause, we must be convinced there is one. And David sees one man stand and defile the armies of God. And he says, here is a cause. Not only was David convinced, but he was convicted of that cause. He was able to overcome the accusations of his family. There are two things that a little boy you don't touch, and that is his older brother and his daddy. And David's big brother questions his intelligence, his integrity, and his intent. Many of them were going to have to overcome the accusation of blood kin. But David, David is not only convinced and convicted, it, he is moved by this cause. And he, he kept asking the people, what is Saul doing? Saul threw out a challenge. And uh, what, what's Saul going to do? He's going to make his family free. He'll give him his daughter uh, for wife. And, um, oh, my mind just went blank now. And... Um, Let me see here. He would enrich him with great riches. Uh, he would give him his daughter and make his house free. They wouldn't be slaves. They would, he would lavish money on them. And then he would be the king's son-in-law. And um, that's when Eliab come down and said, I know the naughtiness of your heart. And David makes a statement that, that I love, and, and it's the text for both of the sermons. What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he goes around asking the question. I really don't think David was asking the people uh, for him to do it per se, but guys, are you listening to what the king's going to Why don't one of you step up? God will use you. God will deliver you. Finally, someone says, hey, there's a little guy down here, and he's, he's talking about Goliath. You ought to hear him. And so King Saul brings him in, and he says, if nobody's going to do it, I'll go fight Goliath. And, and King Saul says, no, David had to overcome the evaluation of authority. A lot of us would have walked out of the tent and said, well, I tried, but King Saul said no, so I, I did what I could. No, David said no. King Saul, you, you've got to understand, I'm a shepherd. And twice, God delivered a, a lion once and a bear once that was taking one of my lambs out of, and I slew them with my bare hands. Now, if you read the scripture here, and it's what he's saying, it represents hand-to-hand -hand combat. David walked up and grabbed the lion's beard and slew him. I like that kind of mama's boy. <laughs> okay. I want that kind of mama's boy on my team, just to be flat out honest with you. He must have said something because King Saul said, okay, you go fight, but you need to wear my armor. My armor. And uh, I, I can just see it. The, the helmet came down. Saul was head and shoulders above everyone else. I can imagine the helmet coming down and David had to keep pushing it up to see. And if he moved, it came down again. And, and, and Saul's armor was so big and David walked around in it. 
He says, I, I can't fight with this. I haven't proved it. And he goes out with just his sling and rocks. But not only was David convinced, convicted, and moved, he also become unstoppable. He walked out, picked up five smooth stones. Now, I, I'm going to say this. It may not be it may not be absolutely true. I can't prove it. You can't disprove it. I really don't think, I really don't think, because the way David was dressed, that King Saul, or I'm sorry, Goliath thought that David was coming out to fight him. He probably thought this, this, this young boy wandered out onto the battlefield. In my mind, I, I'm thinking, he's thinking, I'm going to have fun with this kid. Hey, boy, I'm going to feed your body to the birds. <laughs> Hoping that David would go, ho, 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 and take off running. David responds, you come to me with sword and with spear. But I come to you in the name of the God of Jehovah. And he's going to deliver you into my hands. And not only am I going to make you birdseed, we're going to make the army of Philistines birdseed as well. Well, that made David, that made Goliath upset. Now, we, we have to understand he overcame the intimidation of Goliath. I already told you about his armor. They... They believe that, that Goliath stood anywhere between nine feet and could have been up to 11 feet tall. He's a big guy. And um, he had to overcome all of this. And um, David was moved and he ran out. David picked up, or Goliath picked up his spear and ran toward David. And David ran toward Goliath, put a, a stone in his sling, and let that thing go. Now, again, you can't prove this. You can't disprove it. But I really feel like God directed. That was the first. Um, what kind of missiles are they that, that they put a laser on and, Laser-guided missiles. That was the first laser-guided missile that you're going to find. God took over that little stone and directed it right between Saul's eyes. Now, I know David was, was, was good, but I, I believe God was making sure that that stone hit where it needed to hit. Again, I, I also think that God put sort of a super turbo charge on the end of it. Because when it hit Goliath, his eyes went cross-eyed. He stumbled around. He was probably seeing five or six of David and trying to figure out who should he go to. And all of a sudden, he falls. Now, let me just say this. Let me just say this. Many times in our fightings with, with battles in our life, and Goliaths in our lives, and we face giants. We have the courage to knock them down, but many times we walk away. David knew a valuable lesson that you and I ought to learn. Goliath was not dead. He was only knocked out. And when he came to, he would have one of the most massive headaches he could ever have. And he'd be coming and looking for David. David didn't have a sword, so he climbed up on top of Goliath, pulled out his sword, and chopped his head off. I can just picture it as he stoops down and pulls up Goliath's head, and he points it to the Israelites' army, and then turns around and points it toward the Philistine armies. <laughs> Often in my message, I, I say, the people 
the Philistine armies were going. You know what the Israelites army was doing? They were shocked. The Bible says David led the charge, dragging Goliath's head. There was a great victory that day. In fact, toward the end of that time, King Saul says, I want to see David. And David comes into King Saul's tent, still carrying the head of Goliath. What a wonderful victory. We also notice next that Saul brings David back into his staff and, and um, he, he, he becomes a, a, a general of sort, not the general, but he becomes a general. And uh, David goes out very carefully with, with the uh, children of Israel. In fact, when, when they came back, the, 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 the um, women, began to sing and it makes Saul uh, jealous and um, uh, Saul has Saul has slain his thousands but David his ten thousands but at that point Jonathan and David become very close friends now what is interesting Jonathan is Saul's firstborn son. He was to be king. But as you read the rest of 1 Samuel, it's almost as if Jonathan knows that David is anointed king. And he's fine with that. He's ready to serve under David. But Saul was jealous. And... Um, it, it he he tries to kill David not only not only by throwing as we noticed last week the javelin at David when the evil spirit would work him up but but he gives him his daughter and he requires a hundred foreskins of the Philistine thinking David would be killed and David goes out and kills two hundred Philistines and takes their foreskins off and throws them at at Saul's feet. And um, it, it just, David, Saul wants to kill him. David escapes. And, and finally, Saul is so enraged at a feast that David didn't show because he wanted to kill him. Jonathan is with David and he, he says, I'll, I'll shoot arrows and, and um, it will be a sign. And, and he, the sign was that Saul wanted to kill him. And he goes out and he, he, they weep and they hug and they cry because Jonathan knows he'll probably never see David again. And he said, be merciful to my family, David. Be merciful to my family when you become king. And uh, David starts on the run. He, he, he runs to some priest at uh, Nob and uh, they give him the showbread, which was forbidden to eat, but they give him that. Goliath's sword happened to be there, and they give David the sword. David tells him he's on an errand for the king, and um, they believe him, but King Saul uh, doesn't, and he kills the priest because they helped. Um, they helped David. David goes to the Philistines, but then he gets scared, and so he acts like he's insane, and and um, so they wouldn't kill him because he'd killed Goliath. And um, finally, David uh, runs in the Judean uh, hillsides, in the Judean wilderness. And Saul begins to pursue David. David flees from Saul. Twice we see that in Scripture. We see it in... Um, 1 Samuel um, chapter 24 was the first time that David spared uh, King Saul's life. And then again in chapter 26, he, spared, he could have killed him. It was almost as if God placed Saul in David's hands, but David would not touch God's anointed. And he continues to flee. And during this time, he... he um, he, he 
comes across a man by the name of Nabal. And, and Nabal, sheep, was with David out in the fields, and David would protect his sheep, and, and he and his men needed provision. And so he comes to Nabal and asks them, and Nabal mocks them. And, and uh, his servant said, it's true what he said. He protected. Can't we help them? And, and Nabal mocks him and says, what part do I have with David, the son of Jesse? And, and uh, very wicked man. But he had a wife, Ab excuse me, Abigail, that was very, very nice, very, very kind. And um, she... She goes and, and um, gives David provision. And uh, David blesses her and, and she begs that, that David would not kill um, Nabal. And um, Nabal had a feast. And um, it was at the end of that feast that God smote Nabal. And he died. And David marries Abigail. The rest of um, the rest of, of David's time in 1 Samuel that we notice is this very last segment. David goes and he lives among the Philistines. It's obvious, it's known to the Philistines that King Saul hates David. And um, the king of, of um the Philistines, and uh, we looked at that last week. Achish uh, loves David. He's glad to have David among them. And David goes out and, and, and uh, indicates that he's fighting the enemies of the Philistines, but he actually he's going out and, and uh, raiding the enemies of Israel. And... Um, The king of, of the Philistine, King Achish, he, he's, he's just happy. Well, then it comes time for, for the Philistines to fight Israel again, and they, they draw up their battle. And um, King Achish wants David to go and fight. David agrees to fight. But the, the Philistine general says, no, we don't trust David. We're going to get in the battle. And David's going to turn on us, and we're going to lose the battle. We don't trust him. Send him home. Now, Achish had given David a city of Ziglag. And David um, had left Ziglag, come to fight with King Achish. And um, King Achish is sad, but he sends him home. And when he goes home, um, he finds out that the Amalekites of the Amalekites have killed, have are not killed, but have looted and taken his wife and his possessions and all of the people with David, taken their families and their possessions. And David then goes and, and fights the, the Amalekites or the Amalekites, however you want to pronounce it, it's pronounced both ways. And um, God brings victory. He recovers his, his possessions. He recovers his wife. And um, that's where the story of David ends in 1 Samuel. Because the rest of, of, um, the rest of 1 Samuel is, is um, King King Saul searching out a witch and and um, witch of Endor to bring up the spirit of El of Samuel and and that spirit tells him you're going to die and the very last chapter describes the death of King Saul and his son and even Jonathan and um, the Israelites are without a king when 2 Samuel opens up. And next week we will look at 2 Samuel. We will do the overview of the book of 2 Samuel. And then we will talk about King David. Um, again, I wish I could spend three or four 
uh, weeks on King David. I, I love King David. I It's probably my favorite Old Testament story. And uh, I love to study his leadership abilities. I, I love to study several things that that happened and and God promised him remember this God promised him to be king but it was like 40 years before or so several years before David became king maybe 20 years I, I right offhand it, it it slips me but um it was a while David was content to let God work out his plan. In fact, we find in 2 Samuel, just let me mention this as we close, um, David is anointed king of Judah, and he's, he's the king of Judah for seven years. And um, one of Saul's sons that um, uh, became, I believe it was the king of of um, Israel and um, uh, Ishaboth, which um, he was a son. He did not die. He was the only son that did not die on Mount Gilboa. And they made him king, but he was a weak king. And at the end of seven years, um, Israel came together and made David king. And we will talk about that. And uh, I'm going to open back up with this idea because God, he would not touch God's anointed. And in the very first chap chapter, an Amalekite or Amalekite comes to him and says, I killed King Saul, thinking David would bestow great honor on him. David says, were you not afraid to touch God's anointed? Kill him. And he kills him. And uh, that lesson out of David's life was is very important. Let God have his way. I just wish David would have kept that up throughout his life. But um, he had some he had some problems, but but he always humbled himself. And the difference between David and Saul, Saul blamed the people never humbled himself. And when you really look at it, the sins of Saul were, if you want to put it in, as we like to do, you know, murder is way up here, little white lies way down here, right? But remember, in God's economy, sin is sin. There's no big sins and no small sins. It would appear humanly that Saul's sins were less than David. But what made the difference? Because Saul would not humble himself. And every time David was confronted, he humbled himself before God and admitted, it was me, not the people. It was me. I'm at fault. And I really believe that was what made King David a man after God's own heart. Thank you for this lesson. And uh, we will be posting it. And... Um, Next week, we will talk about, um, in the next lesson, we'll talk about King David. Uh, this is up to King David, but uh, we will talk about David. Thank you very much. Love and appreciate each one of you, and um, we will see you later.